Did you know you can turn one rock into a different rock? I have some examples here. You can turn limestone into marble, or you can turn sandstone into quartzite, or you could even turn shale into schist. All of these second examples are called metamorphic rocks, and metamorphic rocks are what we're going to learn about in this video. In front of me, I have several examples of metamorphic rocks along with their thin sections. A thin section is a sample of rock that's been sliced razor thin so that you can see the details of the grains in fine detail. I also have a special filter. This filter allows me to see the grains in what's called cross-polarized light, or sometimes XPL. Metamorphic rocks are some of the most interesting and confusing rocks. This is because metamorphic rocks aren't the result of one single process, like some igneous and sedimentary rocks are. Metamorphic rocks are really the result of two processes. You start with what's called a protolith, which means first stone. And then you end up with a rock called a metamorphic rock. And metamorphic means changed form. So a metamorphic rock is literally a rock whose form has been changed. The agents of this change in metamorphic rocks are heat and pressure. Let me give you an example of a metamorphic rock and its protolith. This is limestone. It's a sedimentary rock formed from the calcium carbonate shells of sea creatures such as plankton or coral. And here is its thin section. You can see all the little shells of the sea creatures that made up this limestone. You can turn limestone into marble. Marble is limestone that has been heated and squeezed. This heat and pressure recrystallize the calcium carbonate into crystals and you end up with marble. Here is marble's thin section. You can see all those beautiful calcium carbonate crystals that were formed by that heat and pressure. Marble looks quite a bit different from limestone, both in terms of its sample and also in terms of its thin section. And that's because marble is limestone, which has been metamorphosed. Here's another example. This is sandstone. Like limestone, sandstone is also sedimentary and it's made of sand particles that have been cemented together. Here is its thin section. You can see all those little grains of sand sort of glued together with cement. And you can turn sandstone into quartzite. Quartzite is sandstone that's been heated and squeezed. You can see it's a little smoother looking than sandstone, but it's also very, very hard. Quartzite is sandstone that has been heated and squeezed, so those sand particles really get kind of baked together, and you end up with quartzite. Here's its thin section. You can see these grains of sand have kind of been smushed and squashed a little bit. That's from all that heat and pressure that metamorphosed that sandstone into quartzite. Here's a third example. This is shale. Shale is a sedimentary rock formed from very fine particles of clay. Here's its thin section, really, really tiny microscopic sedimentary particles. Now, believe it or not, you can turn shale into this rock, which is called schist. Schist is a rock that has been subjected to intense heat and pressure, and you can easily see how completely different these two rocks are. Here is the thin section for schist. I want you to notice these fine veins or streaks of colored minerals. This is one of the hallmarks of metamorphic rocks if you're looking at a thin section. The grains actually do look a little bit flattened or compressed. That's actually evidence of that pressure that created this metamorphic rock. We have a term for the streaky, flattened appearance of these crystals and its foliation. The kind of foliation we see in this particular example is called schistose foliation. So now we've seen some examples in which our starting rock, our protolith, has been changed, metamorphosed, into a metamorphic rock. Before we go any further, Let's identify the goals of this video. After watching this video, you should be able to understand the basic transformations that define metamorphism and locate where different degrees of metamorphism can take place on Earth and identify some of the most common metamorphic rocks based on their traits.
these are the goals we'll be focusing on in this video. So we know that metamorphic rocks are formed when a pre-existing rock, the protolith, is exposed to heat and pressure. But where do we find these kinds of conditions on Earth? Take a moment to pause the video and see if you can come up with what places on or in Earth would result in a lot of heat and pressure. In your answer, you might have said that we'd find a lot of heat and pressure deep inside Earth. That'd be a great place to look for the conditions to create metamorphic rocks. One of the best places on Earth to find these conditions is called a subduction zone. A subduction zone is a place on Earth where two tectonic plates, huge slabs of rock, are converging. One plate is denser than the other, and this causes that plate to sink, or subduct, beneath the less dense plate. The subducting plate melts in some places, producing magma, which rises in plumes to produce volcanoes in the overriding plate. All these different heat and pressure conditions provide a perfect place to find lots of different kinds of metamorphic rocks. We can illustrate these conditions on a graph, with temperature on the x-axis and pressure on the y-axis. By the way, this graph is sometimes shown upside down. These conditions, where the temperature and pressure are relatively low, would give us low-grade metamorphic rocks. As we move up the graph and to the right, we get mid-grade, and finally high-grade and ultra-high-grade metamorphism. Let's find examples of these different grades of metamorphism. One of the simplest and most common ways to produce metamorphic rocks is to bury them beneath the ocean floor. Over millions of years, sedimentary rocks stack up in layers, pressing on the layers beneath. Eventually, the pressure is great enough to produce some low-grade metamorphic rocks. Some of the most common low-grade metamorphic rocks are slate and marble. Slate's protolith is shale, marble's protolith is limestone. One major mechanism by which regional metamorphism takes place is called burial, and it's exactly what it sounds like. In front of me I have a stack of books and a scale, and each new book that I lay down on the scale represents a new layer of rock, one forming atop the one beneath it. This also happens to demonstrate a principle of geology called the Law of Superposition, which states that the deeper a rock layer is, the older it is. As I stack my books, you can see that the weight experienced by the scale is increasing. Each book experiences the full weight of all the books, all of the rock layers on top of it. This means that a book down here experiences a much greater pressure than a book up here near the surface. So if a layer of rock is buried deep enough under many other layers of rock above it, that rock can experience enough pressure to be changed into a metamorphic rock. Let's find a place with greater heat and pressure conditions. Greater pressures and temperatures move us up the graph and to the right. Now we're moving into mid-grade metamorphism. One of the best places to look for mid-grade metamorphic rocks is where mountains are being formed. In this subduction zone, we find mountains here. The rocks in this less dense plate are getting squeezed, and they sort of buckle and fold up under high pressure as the denser plate subducts. Mid-grade metamorphic rocks will form here. Some common mid-grade metamorphic rocks are phyllite and schist. Both can be made from the protolith shale. Now let's find some high-grade metamorphic conditions. Now we're moving farther up the graph and to the right. These rocks are produced under huge pressure, which means we find them being made deep beneath Earth's surface. Far beneath the base of these mountains, the pressure and temperature conditions are great enough to produce high-grade metamorphic rocks, such as gneiss. We can go even deeper to find ultra-high-grade metamorphic conditions. In this subducting tectonic slab, the metamorphic conditions are so extreme that the rocks become soft and malleable. One of the highest-grade metamorphic rocks you can find is called eclogite. The conditions we've seen so far occur within large volumes of rock. As such, these types of metamorphism are sometimes called regional metamorphism. Heat and pressure over large areas result in regional metamorphism. However, there's another class of metamorphism we find in this cross-section, and it's right here, near this hot magma. In this situation, we're at the bottom of the graph, but moving along to the right. Magma is extremely hot. It is melted rock, after all. And as it pokes its way up through the rocks, it heats them enough to produce metamorphism. However, this metamorphism is not associated with great pressure because it's happening so near Earth's surface. This metamorphism is called contact metamorphism, based on the contact between magma and the surrounding rock. Contact metamorphism would probably best be considered a type of low-grade metamorphism. 
Hornfels is a common rock produced from contact metamorphism. Let's take a closer look at our graph of temperature and pressure for a moment. As illustrated, this graph is broken into differently colored areas called facies. Each facies represents a group of metamorphic rocks related by the conditions of heat and pressure in which they form. However, the names of many of these facies aren't really in common usage. For instance, the zeolite facies are probably better represented by slate and marble. If we instead populate this graph with metamorphic rocks as they're commonly named, it would probably look a bit like this. We see that slate and marble fall into low grade, phyllite and schist are mostly mid grade, while gneiss and eclogite represent high and ultra high grade, respectively. Don't forget hornfells down here. Here I've used clay beads to recreate two similar rock samples. The clay beads represent individual grains in the rock, different colors might represent different minerals. Since this is soft clay, I can slice through the rock and show you what a thin section of that sample might look like. I'll cut this one. This represents our protolith, a rock before it's been metamorphosed. So I'll slice through that. When I create our thin section, notice that most of the grains are evenly sized, in the sense that they're about as tall as they are wide. But I'm going to take our other rock sample and subject it to some pressure, as might happen in a metamorphic rock. I'll use the bottom of this glass to exert some pressure and compress our rock. Okay. There's our metamorphic rock. Now when I create a thin section of our metamorphic rock, let's see how these grains appear. These grains are sort of stretched or smeared out. And in this case, the grains are stretched out at a 90 degree angle to the axis of pressure. The pressure came from directly above, vertically, and as a result, the grains are flattened out horizontally. This appearance of flattening is called foliation. Many, but not all, metamorphic rocks have some degree of foliation. Low-grade metamorphism can result in foliation that's so small it's hard to see, whereas higher degrees of metamorphism can create foliation that's very easy to see and results in some really high luster. And not all metamorphic rocks have flattened crystals like these. Contact metamorphism doesn't usually produce any kind of foliation because there's not a significant pressure component. However, if you find a lot of glitter or luster in a hand sample, it's a pretty good bet that it's probably metamorphic. Let's look at what the different grades of metamorphism do to the grains of their corresponding rocks. We're talking about the thin sections we saw earlier. For our purposes, let's imagine we're starting with a shale protolith and exposing it to increasing degrees of metamorphism. Shale is a sedimentary rock made of fine grains of clay. At low-grade metamorphic conditions, the clay grains in shale are heated and sort of get fused together. This hardens the rock into slate, but the grains in the thin section are barely affected. We might call the grains baked sediments, with a small degree of deformation. Once we move into mid-grade conditions, we're generally looking at crystals. Any baked sediments that existed in the low-grade rocks have been softened and reformed into crystals. We can identify crystals by their geometrical, tight-fitting appearance. Metamorphic rocks often have flattened, smeared-out crystals that loosely follow a particular axis or direction. This flattening along an axis is called foliation. Foliation sometimes has a wavy or streaked appearance in a thin section. Foliation happens because the crystals soften and flatten out as a result of the increasing heat and pressure. Phyllite is a good example of a mid-grade metamorphic rock with a small degree of foliation. You might see fine fibrous crystals or little blocky crystals only slightly aligned upon an axis of foliation. Schist usually has a stronger degree of foliation with larger grains, and it even has a type of foliation named after it, schistose foliation. Moving up into high grade, the grains continue to soften under higher and higher pressure. This is where we find large foliated crystals, although the flattening in the crystals can be difficult to find. This foliation gives gneiss its unique appearance, and it's even named after it, gneissic foliation. It's here that we begin to notice a reversal in the foliation trend. As we moved up from low grade into mid grade, we saw universal foliation, but at the higher degrees of metamorphism, the conditions are so extreme that the crystals begin to lose their flattened appearance. We get rocks like aclagite, whose thin section looks more like an igneous rock than metamorphic. Really no foliation here. Here's a summary of the metamorphic trends we find in this graph. Going deeper beneath Earth's surface gives us higher degrees of metamorphism. From low-grade to high-grade metamorphism, we find that a rock's grains go from baked sediments to crystals. 
we also find that the size of the grains increases as the grade of metamorphism increases. Finally, foliation increases from low grade through mid grade, but is usually lost at extremely high grade metamorphic conditions. Let's review the goals of this video to make sure that you met them. After watching this video, you should be able to understand the basic transformations that define metamorphism, and locate where different degrees of metamorphism can take place on Earth, and identify some of the most common metamorphic rocks based on their traits. If you can't do that, go back and watch the parts of the video that you didn't understand. Until next time, remember, you can learn anything. Thank <laughs> you.